Hey there friends, Drex here back with another interview for my Profiles in Flow series. This is a video series and podcast where I interview really incredible personalities in the flow arts who have done some really remarkable uh, things with their creative careers. Today, my guest is uh, the founder of the Flow Asus, as well as Third Earth Fireproof. She is a board member of NAFA and was the first licensed fire producer in New York City. Uh, I'd like to welcome to the program Tara McManus. Thanks so much for joining me today, Tara. Hey, Ben. How's it going? It is going very, very well. Thank you, uh, thank you for agreeing to do this. We were originally supposed to do this a different day, and then it came together very, very quickly. So we're, we're, both, uh, we're both kind of uh, running to catch up here. But thank you. Yeah, no problem. This worked out. I got a chunk of time. Word. Um, so I'm just going to start off by asking you how exactly you got into the flow arts. How long ago was that? Um, I think around 2006, I, uh, got introduced to flow arts through burner parties. I went to my first decompression in a warehouse party and, um, I, I like, you know, I was trying to think back to when was the first time I saw flow arts and I guess in college, even before then I saw people with hula hoops. And a fire performance on campus, mm -hmm. but uh, the burner community has a way of making you feel connected uh, with the art that you're watching. And so uh, it took it took a while for me to start with fire, which now is really my what I lean into career wise. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I would say it's been. At least 10 years now. Yeah. <laughs> I. Uh, yes. I I was in New York City myself the winter of uh, 2007 to 2008, I want to say. And I remember, like, there being a fire scene set up around, you know, like the House of Yes and Wonderland and everything. Were you, were you a part of that scene? Oh, totally, yeah. Um, I've been working with the House of Yes uh, ladies for probably since exactly that time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was... it is kind of the circus adjacent thing, the flow arts. And I was like the flow artist that ran with all the aerialists. Oh, I gotcha. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the fire scene existed. It actually took me a little while to kind of be welcomed into the New York city fire scene. I felt really welcomed in, uh, in at PEX mm -hmm. Summerfest uh, by all the Philly and DC folk. And um, then I, you know, got back to New York and was like, yeah, I want to do a lot more of this. And, um, worked my way in. Work. So what was it about fire spinning that drew you in? Uh, the camaraderie. I always think back to what really appealed to me. You know, I had seen a few shows at parties or spin. I hadn't really seen spin jams yet. So, uh, seeing shows didn't it really draw me in. I was definitely impressed. Mm -hmm. Um, but seeing a spin jam and seeing how people help each other out, with like safety each other, lending each other fuel, helping each other dunk. Um, I didn't realize how much teamwork and prep and um, like fun precautions, <laughs> those words don't really go together, but that, <laughs> uh, you know, I just seeing people get each other's back really appealed to me. And uh, people are really sexy when they spin fire. Like I wanted to get in there. <laughs> well, wow. so was, was fire safety even then something that was a really important part to you about being in the scene? Um, <clears throat> I saw it as, I saw it as the friendship of the, like, get done with your burn, someone doobies you out, you hug, you high five, um, watching, like, even just like watching people kind of line up, check in with each other. Um, people challenge each other and stuff like that. I, I think the interaction between the fire spinners and safety being one of those things yeah. was something that I really liked. People burning together, uh, stuff like that. Just that kind of like impromptu fun that's had at spin jams. Yeah. So what, what were you doing with your life when you got into the flow arts? What was kind of like your, your civilian alter ego at the time? I was working in fashion. I, uh, with a, leaning towards costume design. Um, funny thing is that still to this day, I wanted to do costume design 
uh, for Broadway and couldn't figure out how to penetrate the unions. And now, I'm, now I'm trying to do pyrotechnics on Broadway and still trying to penetrate the <laughs> unions. Um, and you know, I'm chipping away. Mm-hmm. But uh, so I bounced around a lot of fashion jobs. Uh, I feel like when I got into the industry, everything kind of started to collapse with a lot of the labor moving to China. Uh, the job description went from being a creative to being a tech and doing a lot of measurements and doing things on Illustrator. It wasn't really creatively challenging for me. Uh, So I moved around into, I did puppet design and uh, trend forecasting. So I did some web stuff. I was doing a lot of graphics, but more creative, like mood boards and collages and stuff. Sure. Um, And yeah, I was probably in the trend forecasting world when I, Trend forecasting, and I also designed Halloween costumes. Hmm. Around that time was when I picked up a hula hoop and started going to jams and stuff, and and that started to usurp all of my free time. Uh, eventually, to the point where I couldn't stand being in an office anymore. There's something about flow arts that makes you hate cubicles. <laughs> that is very true. <laughs> so, how how did you start to make that transition over to being a, a full time flow artist then? Um, so here's a, here's a, a little known fact. Uh, you tell, uh, I was seeing someone who was, um, very, very, uh, wacky improv comedian who toured around, uh, doing improv theater and doing film documentaries about comedies. And, um, he started, giving me and the House of Yes grants uh, Hmm. to work on our creative projects. And I had a clothing line that I was making for circus performers, aerialists, and stilt walkers. Um, And he helped me out with getting machines and things like that. Mm -hmm. And um, I really looked to him for advice. Um, We, he bounces around. So he's kind of a, one of my road lovers. And um, I was having a difficult time at work designing Halloween costumes, I was like, everything I had designed was doing great, but I was constantly in trouble for coming in late all the time. (sighs) All the the office bullshit that I didn't care for. I'm kind of the person who will like be extremely focused on only what I like doing and then completely bury my head in the sand when it comes to stuff I don't like doing. And that makes me a difficult coworker. (laughs) Uh, so I'm, I'm much better at running my own thing and hiring people to do this shit that I just can't. Uh, and you know, he had told me that for a long time. He could see that in me. So, um, I, uh, was, uh, really at my wit's end with my job. I found out that stretch Kevlar existed at a spin jam. Somebody brought these uh, industrial built sleeves Mm -hmm. and, um, I wanted to buy a roll of Kevlar and spent a lot of time sourcing and researching and I couldn't afford it. I tried calling him and, uh, to see if I could get a grant and I found out that, um, he had committed suicide. Holy crap. And, uh, I quit my job that day. Uh, actually that I found that out. I, I left work early cried for an entire day and I got a call the next day that was a job offer to freelance on Broadway, um, building puppets. Mm -hmm. And so I walked in the next day and quit. Um, and, uh, then I went to fire drums. Well, so I bought my roll of Kevlar. I made some sleeves. I made some shirts. I ruined the blades on my serger. I (laughs) learned, uh, I destroyed scissors. I made a lot of mistakes and I went to fire drums and, um, spent most of the time crying, which was great. Cathartic, life changing and realize that if I don't get on the road and dedicate myself, my life to what I want to do that, like I would end up like him. So that was really the moment. It was like just one day this happened. Another, a job offer came in. I quit my job and I've never worked for another company full time ever again. That is incredible and super intense. I'm so sorry. That must have been a lot to go through. Yeah, it, and it, it happened uh, shortly after Burning Dan passed away. And so, um, 
even though people that I was meeting on in the flow world uh, didn't know him, um, they had someone who influenced them greatly, who also had an untimely passing, and uh, we could relate. And it was the the flow community was super there for me, um, and really like it showed me the way. It just literally opened up the road. And uh, another funny side note is that I did not know how to drive. Uh, oh. <laughs> You've had to do quite a lot of that since then. And I went out and I was like, I'm going to tour. Uh, and so I like bought a van and then learned to drive it and then got my license. Oh my God. And, <laughs> and then I put, I put like almost 200,000 miles on that van in the past six years Wow. So the, so this was basically like the birth of Third Earth Fireproof, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, coincidentally, um, I was pressuring uh, a few other people who were um, soon to be co-founders of the Floasis to quit their day jobs. And, uh, and then we all decided to move in together and we found the Floasis. Mm-hmm. So it all... There was a huge amount of momentum where I don't even feel like I was making decisions for myself. Uh, there was just this just undeniable force pushing me into this. Yeah. So, like, did you have a plan when you started up Third Earth Fireproof? Or did you just kind of figure that you would see where the winds took you on it? I wanted to meet customers in person and get feedback. Mm -hmm. item for item and um, city by city and one customer at a time. And um, so no business plan, Uh, (laughs) a a roll of Kevlar and uh, some machines that I routinely broke Mm -hmm. and um, a lot of tenacity. Just every time something would break, I'd try and figure out why, you know, I I was using a fabric that's four times the strength of steel so it just wears through everything. And, uh, uh, yeah, like I, I love researching. Um, and so I found that I had a lot of transferable skills that I didn't think I would use, um, to help me plan a tour and, and go around. And then the cool thing is, is like the best way to engage my customers is, you know, what do you spin and how do you burn yourself? Right. And people walk in, Years later, now I can have this conversation and I could, you know, a beginner can walk in and say like, I want to get into double staffs and I don't know what to anticipate. And I say, you know, you need the full arm sleeves because yeah. you're going to get these guys. Yeah. And Give the hoopers, your hands. <laughs> you know, the fan spinners and I spin a little bit of every prop. And now with my many years of experience, I can just like pull up my sleeve and point to where you will expect to get burned. That's great. Um, and so that kind of segued into me being seen as the fire safety expert. Interesting. So I want to back up just for one second here. Um, Can you take me through your, your first year uh, running third earth fireproof and like, how exactly did you grow your company? How exactly did you make sure that people knew who you were and how did you, how did you go from a uh, gorilla, gorilla saleswoman in a van to, you know, running this operation in the Floasis, which you have employees, which is really, really awesome and very, very rare amongst flow entrepreneurs? Yeah, I still have more volunteers than I have employees, but... Um, but you've got employees. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, if the community wasn't so excited uh, about helping I couldn't but um so I latched on to someone doing what I wanted to do and asked how could I be a part of it Mm -hmm. it's like a tip for any business um so I started working with burning passion and Mm -hmm. um at the time I had enough merch to fit in a suitcase so especially when I didn't know how to drive I had a huge need for that and um burning passion uh really had a, a setup established tour so i would fly into a major city near a festival and 
And uh, Paul would pick me up and drive me to the festival, and then we could share his resources. So that worked for a couple of years until everything expanded, and I was like starting to bring grid walls and uh, rolling racks and everything else. And that's when I branched off into um, needing my own vehicle. And with the help of uh, the other founders of the Floasis, the Ninja Pirates, and Icon Artistry, my good friend Connie, um, we just we shared resources. There is no way for me to have all that at my fingertips at once. Yeah. So Connie had screen printing, and I had clothes. So my when we lived together, my stuff was covered in screens. I love seeing my old school tie pants like still being worn that have satanic screen prints on the side <laughs> that's connie's touch nice um and we used to stay up late and i'd be like i like that one and that one and that one and she would throw down ink and we would just jam out um and uh you know i convinced the christina and skiffle to join me on the road and quit their day jobs and um and so that was extremely helpful because honestly, Skiffle did most of the driving for my first year. Mm -hmm. uh, we were also towing a trailer full of all of their staves. And uh, I, I mean, I grew up with a tractor trailer truck driver as a dad. It's just funny that I didn't learn to drive, but um, <laughs> like, I, I was like, great, you do the thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, <clears throat> sharing resources and meeting people. I have, had an Etsy store since Etsy started because mm -hmm. I was selling um, spandex stuff before that. Yeah. So I had a, an understanding of like how to list things online. And I think social media was on the climb. I wouldn't have been able to do it without the internet, obviously yeah, totally. um, as for any niche market. Right. And, um, and uh, you know, I tried to produce my own shows that were fashion shows with fire and, um, you know, those, that was not really successful, but it tried it through some things at the wall. Mm -hmm. I mean, the fire festivals without a doubt, uh, were the biggest <laughs> contributing factor to like me having a business. Yeah. So what do you think was the biggest challenge that you had to overcome in going through your fireproof and, and how did you overcome it? Um, well, the first challenge was that it wasn't ubiquitous yet. Mm -hmm. um, and so my first festival, people were like, I haven't needed flame retardant clothing. Right. So like, I don't think there's a need for it. Why would you do this? Um, and if you just keep at it and you're at every single festival and people love your products and spread the word for you, then... So it became ubiquitous to the point where you know, people would walk into my booth and say like, wow, I'm so glad like one of these companies that makes Kevlar shrugs is here. And I'm like, there is, there's only, only one company. One. <laughs> people think that they're a is really fun. Um, and people would ask me, well, how'd you get hired by this company? And that's really flattering. <laughs> um, so uh, just sticking with it really um, create, create, I don't want to say created the need for it because I think there was a need for it before. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of those cases where people don't know what they need until you put it in front of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and fire spinning also became at the same time um, is so based on education mm -hmm. and peer peer to peer education that um, we can't, in good conscience, teach someone to spin fire and and just ignore those kinds of safety things that you have to tell someone, like, don't wear your spandex leggings and, and your nylon coat or whatever. Um, so when, I think it was maybe when I was first starting, kind of like an elitist group that were too cool for school and not very welcoming because of the festival culture and the love for teaching. Um, and it became so much more inviting to new people yeah. that like, safety education has to go hand in hand because 
there's liability and like, and you know, we care about our people. And of course I bend some rules more than, uh, I tell my beginners that they can, right. uh, because I have all the years of experience and like can mitigate some risks in my own spinning. Yeah. Um, whereas a beginner just can't mitigate the risk of maybe hitting themselves because they're learning. So yeah, I think the teaching culture and things like that, um, really brought this culture of safety about, um, I realized early on that people had to trust what I say. Yeah. Um, and as a textile, you know, so I was a degree in textiles and worked in the garment district for eight years. I, I have that to back me, but I felt now I also need more of an education on fire performance safety. And it existed by word of mouth from many fire mamas and papas uh, in many cities. Um, so every time I go to a festival, I find out who that is, what they're, you know, and I go and I take the class where I m think I might know everything, but I always learn something. Yeah. Especially anecdotes. Mm -hmm. No, a that's, lot, sorry, go ahead. A lot of what I teach is a collection of anecdotes that I then go home and try and research why and how. Yeah. Um, and talk with the people that were there for those crazy stories of that polyester skirt that melted into someone's legs and, you know, things like that, or being there for the person that ends up doused in fuel transfer and on fire and, and watching the safeties handle it correctly. And, right. um, so yeah, again, like sharing resources, uh, I really just, I wanted to be seen as the expert to be able to be totally honest about why my products were important. And then, um, you know, it just became more and more important to me overall. Yeah. I just want to seize on one thing that you said in there, which, you know, this is a thing that I tell a lot of people uh, when it comes to teaching is that the most, one of the most important things that you can do as a teacher is to take other people's classes because you never know when you're going to run across something that you don't know. And if more than that, you have to remember what it is like to be a student, because once you forget that, you know, you, you start having problems connecting with your students and then it's, a long and unpleasant road to being irrelevant. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Cool. Well, so I'm, 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 I'm tempted to ask you a couple. Well, I'm just going to go ahead and do it. If we go over time, we go over time. But um, if you were going to restart Third Earth Fireproof today from scratch, what would you do different? I would not make clothing. <laughs> <laughs> I would not. Uh, I said, my whole business is sleeves. Yeah. It is sleeves, it's sleeves, it's sleeves. Clothing is such a frustrating endeavor that I pay rent on five-year-old merch every month. Mm -hmm. Every month, hundreds of dollars is spent on stuff that people want in a different color or a different size. Yeah. Uh, and people will always want you to make something from scratch. Uh, <laughs> uh, and they don't know, realize that what makes it possible for you to get it at that price is that you're working with economies of scale. And the more special a snowflake you want to be with, every, with whatever you're ordering, the bigger problem you're creating for whoever's on the other end. Thank you. Yeah. Like, I work with a small factory in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. And... Um, they have a 120 piece minimum and that's the smallest minimum I could find in the garment district. Wow. And also, um, there are sample rooms, but because of the way all the jobs have gone to China, uh, the sample rooms are only doing production for couture designers and gotcha. they might have a 30 piece minimum, but, uh, they will charge easily like $200 a piece. Yeah. So, and I'm dealing with fabrics that cost four times the average fabric cost. Right. So, um, yeah, people don't realize scale and, um, everybody wants a certain size and a certain color. Um, and if they see a lot of options, they walk away because they can't decide right. or they see a lot of <laughs> options and they think that you can make more options. So, um, yeah, the apparel business was never worth my time. And I was 
told myself that, you know, if I could get in that time machine, I would, and I'd be saving a lot of money on rents on stock that I have right now. Yeah. But the sleeves are still a winner. Sleeves are, sleeves are killing it, you know, sleeves and doobies. That's all I should have stuck to. Yeah. And I put that in a suitcase. Right. Totally. Well, for what it's worth, I still love the uh, long sleeve shirt that I got from you. And I still wear it every chance I get because it's awesome. Yeah, it looks great on you too. Oh, thank you. Cool. You know, uh, I'm a tall person, mm-hmm. and so my shirts are long, and my the, the arms and the waist are very long. And I know you're very long waisted and tall. Yep. And and so, uh, yeah, that's. I mean, unfortunately, short people have like this yeah. <laughs> with my shirts. I mean, human bodies are all different. <laughs> turns out. Yeah. No, and I, I really, really, really appreciate that about your clothes too, because, um, you know, I, I, I have a really, really difficult time sometimes finding stuff that will fit me properly simply because like my measurements are so very, I'm not going to call them rare, but they're definitely unusual, uh, among guys. Um, so I, I appreciate that you have clothes that, uh, that work for me because there are a few other people that do. Yeah, totally. And I, 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 I lucked out with my shrug design in that, um, plus size women are able to fit in the shrugs with very, uh, mm. fewer challenges than they fit in most tops Yeah, because it doesn't have it around the bust. Um, that's, I mean, that's a major sticking point for women getting things to fit in general is, I, I mean, I'm sure you've heard women bitch about bras. Yes. It's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. Uh, And it goes into tops as well. And so creating a shirt or just arm protection that does not go across the front and only across the back opened up this whole market of plus size women. And I have to say, um, they're super loyal, awesome customers who, when they find something that they like, they bring all their friends (laughs) in and they gush about how much they love it. And, and that was like um, a surprise for me that I'm I'm really glad that I, f- I discovered that. Yeah. Um, and I had a little bit of that when I was doing the spandex clothing line. I had a plus size model, um, just because I she's a fucking badass. Yeah. I, uh, it wasn't like I need to consider this demographic. It was just like this chick with the like side shave and she's so emotive and like this is who my customer is Mm -hmm. when I put that out on Etsy I got a lot of emails and feedback like thank you for having larger women women of color and all that and I was like well yeah she's fucking badass love her so um yeah I think um, and that goes further into that whole thing of finding that niche you know yeah, and one thing I do like about doing apparel is that, um, like, when you do get a person into clothing that fits them, and when they've had a hard time finding that, um, they can they feel like themselves, and um, like you really see it li- uplift their mood and stuff. And like that, I would say is something that you know uh, was a big motivator for me to do all that the apparel. But um, for sure, double edged sword is like. I can only afford to make small, medium, large, extra large. And like, there are a lot of bodies that still don't fit in things. And so I just have all those old unsold stuff. I can imagine. Yeah. So I guess that's the curse and the blessing there. Yeah. I I could probably talk to you for an entire hour just about like your experiences with garments and everything, but, (laughs) uh, you, you are such a serial entrepreneur that we, 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 we've, we've got to explore a few other things here. Um, which... I, every eight years, I change industries. <laughs> so, <laughs> Set a clock by it, huh? Pretty much. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize it, but I, looking back, that's how it's been going. I have some vague recollection of there being something about like a neurotransmitter that... I want to say it's oxytocin, maybe, but, but don't quote me on that, that like every neurotransmitter essentially has a point at which it exhausts the capacity of its receptor to, um, uh, which we call it to, to, uh, kind of absorb it. Um, and the different neurotransmitter, the, the different receptor sites have different tolerances for this. 
and I might just be talking out my rear end. I, I, I haven't actually double checked with the research on this, but I remember hearing at one point that there was a longer term neurotransmitter that right around the seven or eight year mark is when, you know, the, the, the receptors for it start to, t- to wear out on, you know, receiving it for, for a given pursuit or for a given um, uh, experience that causes it. And this was their kind of explanation for the whole seven year itch phenomenon uh, that happens in relationships. But uh, again, I, I haven't double checked the research on that. So don't take that as uh, don't, don't, don't take that as the gospel truth here. Yeah. 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 Instead of relationships, I have businesses. There you go. Well, I mean, that is a relationship though. Oh yeah. <laughs> Cool. So how about we talk about the Floasis for a second? Because that's also kind of an unusual situation to find yourself in. And it already sounds like one of the great benefits that you found from it was the ability to collaborate with other people that were operating businesses inside of Flow Arts. Um, So you'd already mentioned that you had kind of talked with some other people that had business interests that overlapped with your own. And you guys found a place that you could all rent out together and essentially have a more or less collaborative space. But it's also grown into something that, you know, you host classes there, you host events there and everything. How did, how did the Floasis grow and evolve over time? Um, well, the Floasis was a, a collaborative event where Flow Arts was one of maybe four pieces mm-hmm. to it. Um, so <clears throat> there were, there was a band recording space in the basement Musicians would come over all the time and jam out. Um, there were a, a lot of musical projects going on, um, and which was a very cool thing to incorporate into to spinning events. So there was like overlap there. We could have live music and have people come out and spin. Uh, and then there was the uh, the maker aspect, which was um, really um, mostly on the end of Connie and Icon Artistry. Mm-hmm. She had an immense amount of screen printing equipment. And uh, mm-hmm. the, the, such is the problem in New York City with real estate uh, being so expensive. So, And uh, she had really specific power needs, too, for her heaters. Yeah. Um, so that's how we ended up finding the location we're at now. Uh, it needed to have need to be ground floor and need to have a, a big power supply hmm. and me Connie and Christina Hawks all just happened to also spin fire we weren't looking for let's start New York City's you know premier fire spinning space and we didn't even have an intention of it being educational at the time huh. um, so it was Connie looked at the very first place she looked at was this space Hmm. and they were like oh it also has a 1600 square foot backyard if you could do something with that (laughs) said the real estate agent and connie's jaw hit the ground (laughs) does pictures um and so um i even you know like connie wanted to do due diligence and we went and looked at other places but after you see this backyard Mm-hmm. You can't see another space. It's over, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, hands down, we had to have it, and it was going to be, we're going to spin fire here. And it took us months to, to like, even ask our landlord if it was going to be okay to do, and, like, we were really in the shadows about it at first. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, the rent here is too damn high, and so the other founding members... Um, moved out and moved to cities where it's cheaper and it's now own property and, um, and are flourishing and doing great. And I have, uh, had to fill every space that was a artist making space with bedrooms, yeah. uh, because our rent is about $6,000 a month. Good Lord. So, um, in New York, you can get an artist studio for about 500 and a bedroom for about a thousand. Right. And this is not economical to have small businesses here. Um, so even my sewing studio is in another building. Oh, really? I didn't realize that. Yeah. Because it's half the rent that I would pay here in my own space. Oh, my goodness. So. so uh, and, but having all those bedrooms affords us 
a thousand square foot dance studio. Mm -hmm. I think it's more than a thousand, maybe 15, no, eh, roughly a thousand square foot yeah. uh, dance studio where we put down Pergo flooring and shatterproof mirrors. Uh, we raised the ceilings, we pulled up the sprinklers. Um, that was a big Kickstarter. Um, when uh, Lydia Brooks, my awesome um, business partner, came in and said, you know, let's form an LLC, let's trademark our logo, let's have a liability shield because, holy shit, you're <laughs> teaching hundreds of people a very dangerous thing in a very cramped city, and we need, we need a liability shield. And um, she kind of talked some sense into, into this. And um, with the support of the teachers um, and just trial and error, Semester after semester, we do two months of teaching, one month of promoting. Um, we've done that every year for three or four years now. Um, and we created a system. We figured out an average price that people can afford. Hmm. We figured out average times of the day that work for people. Um, we, I figured out ways that works well for interaction between beginners and intermediate students. Uh, ways to get people out of their shell to perform in front of each other, um, sharing a lot of notes. Uh, Wolf Bouquet uh, is actually really helpful with that as well. She's uh, she's a beast of a teacher, hmm. uh, and um, and she has, you know, we've compared notes a lot about how to incorporate fun and flow into the structure, and um, and we got it down to a system that. Um, the class system has really been my way of trying to manage humans and say, like, this is what you get. You get this time slot, and this is what I ask for, like, 20% of what you make. You make nothing. I make nothing. Yeah. I encourage experimentation, um, but, you know, throw 20% in our tip jar, and we will supply fuel and toilet paper and keep the lights on, and I don't. I don't promote for you. I don't, I mean, I do, but I don't guarantee it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I just provide you a, cl a clean space and, and, and hope that the teachers learn to promote themselves and stuff. Cause I do, uh, ultimately want to be able to walk away and have it run without me. Yeah. Um, and so many, like many years of doing this, it's, it's pretty much at that point. Like I'm working full time, um, as a fire producer and people let themselves in, they run their class, they let themselves out and, you know, I come home and the lights are off and the doors are locked. So, you know, I feel good about that. I mean, at that point, it's almost a passive income stream. Right. Yeah. I mean, um, it pays for all of my toilet paper, paper towels. Now we can afford a cleaner once a week. Woo. Yeah. Yeah. And that is like, thank God. So, so yeah. Real quick, I want to grab onto something. For those of you guys who are out there watching or listening who are trying to run classes in your own parts of the country and everything, just as a point of comparison, um, for New York City, what are the answers to those questions? What's the ideal time? What's the ideal price? What we do is um, <clears throat> Monday through Thursday, we have classes. Uh, beginner level of a prop is uh, seven to eight thirty or eight fifteen, mm -hmm. and that intermediate level is eight thirty to ten, and so uh, that allows beginner students to mingle with the intermediate students on the same type of prop, Ooh. and it, it gives the beginners motivation to keep going. We have a lot more student retention when they see people that they look up to. That's so, really cool. Yeah, and one thing that Wolf does that I think is great is um, our basement space is still, a, you know, not the biggest, and so she'll teach something very structured in uh, in front of the mirrors and um, your basic drilling this and that, and then for the last half of the class, she takes them outside and she puts on really fun music. I love I like uh, swing house and stuff mm -hmm. and uh lets people jam out and i think uh jamming out without mirror removes that self-consciousness sure. and um and it's just really engaging and um and she keeps it fun so that's something that um i value that she's brought to the table and 
Uh, our price structure is if you want to drop into a class, it's $35. Okay. It's up to the teacher if they're going to take drop-ins or not. Sure. Honestly, like we don't fill classes, so that we always take drop-ins. Um, and teachers have learned to be flexible. If someone comes in and has like no background, they can give them something to do. Yeah. Um, and that, cause that's a big barrier to entry. So, um, especially time commitments in New York city where everyone has five jobs. Sure. Um, and seven o'clock is like just enough time for people to get here from work. Usually most people work till six. Um, and in New York city, we have a, uh, like a infinite amount of students. There are <laughs> eight and a half million people mm-hmm. here. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And there's also a lot of press, uh, that's come through because, there's always like fun things to do in New York city, right. fun things to do, fun educational things to do, fun uh, exercises. So there's a lot of, um, angles, uh, taking the direct angle of like, this is flow arts and this is why everyone should do it. No reporter cares about, it. <laughs> but like fun ways to burn fat and some kind of pun right, totally. fire is mm-hmm. the sex appeal that, reporters want right and like you're gonna get shoehorned when you get press it's fine just like make sure you're shoehorned the right way right uh pricing structure wise so we do 35 dollars for drop-ins or 25 dollars a class for a series we i like to do a eight week series mm-hmm. so it's 200 dollars um if a teacher has time constraints they'll do a four week series for a hundred so you're getting ten dollars off a class, and incentivizes them to buy it all. Sure. Outright. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not a bad idea to offer a swing class when um, a lot of students miss one class to offer a makeup class. Mm-hmm. Um, and we do you do eight weeks to graduate with fire, and uh, that's optional. And you get a mini safety lesson, but we highly encourage that you come to my four hour safety course. Um, not required. Yeah. And, um, and then we, what ends up happening is that teachers often ask for a ninth week. Interesting. If students still are nervous about their first burn. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm really gentle about timelines. That's why I have a built in month where there is no programming. That month gets filled with, um, students who want private tutoring, uh, students who want to do a makeup class, uh, people who just, they want to burn, but they're not ready. Sure. Um, mm-hmm. So we have that for them. And then a week or two after graduation week, we turn one of the spin jams into a student teacher showcase. Mm-hmm. And um, aesthetically, the major difference between a spin jam and the student teacher showcase is that we put out chairs And uh, we clean the house a little more. Um, And with my programming, I try and and have the following semester schedule ready and have tons of handouts, printouts of the entire schedule and gift certificates and things like that. Encourage students to bring family and friends. Mm -hmm. This is something I learned from uh, Flying Trapeze School in Manhattan is uh, they have graduation shows and people love to go to that. It's in the summertime, it's outdoors on a pier and you get to watch flying trapeze and it's your friend yeah. and you get to cheer them on. Um, so, uh, and then you walk out of there with pamphlets. So that's how we hook, hook the friends and family. Outstanding. Yeah. And so, and I create the breaks in our semesters, uh, around like December is a break so we can sell gift certificates you start your classes in January. So you're meeting your, um, new year's resolution. And there's a million ways that you can shoehorn like fire spinning, uh, community events, exercise, flow arts into most people's new year's resolutions. Sure. Um, but I also give them a week for their hangover. So we start like, the <laughs> good plan. <laughs> Yeah, and this is you know year. This is years and years and years of doing this. I, I was about to say, like you, you should be writing the book on this. <laughs> and always break in August because everyone's going to go to Burning Man. Sure. Um, 
And during the break, there are a lot of people who wish they were at Burning Man that I, if I'm in New York City, I do at FOMO Burn. And surprisingly, I've had the hugest turnout of non-Flo artists through our doors at that time. Yeah. Um, so for me, it was a way to connect with Burning Man. So, you know, that is a way that you can engage people into flow arts is like, it's a great way to really feel like part of it. Totally. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, right. Price schedule, gift certificates, getting people in the door. Yeah. All important stuff. Very important stuff. (laughs) Wow. And then putting that all on a website plus like rental space and that that's always been a struggle to like make it cohesive there's yeah. like constant people who are interested but confused on how to get into it right and the more you need to handhold them and everything the more work that creates for you yeah i i started a class for people especially reporters reporters want to walk in uh never understanding what fire arts or flow arts is and walk out with a video of them spinning a fire prop and they don't even know what fire props, what options they have. Right. And they want to get it done in the, in under four hours. Yeah. So I created this class called the beginner's guide to fire and, um, the weird, okay. A totally unexpected market is weddings. Um, I have a <laughs> Do you tell? Couples will often buy classes, like waltzing classes or something. Sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, for their first dance, yeah. Yeah, but it also extends to things that they won't even do at the wedding. Mm-hmm. Um, so fire spinning has been one of them. So this Beginner's Guide to Fire, I've had a lot of uh, spouses-to-be. And... Um, it's like, it's just a bonding thing for them to do. Uh, fear facing is a, another great angle with a class like that because it's fire in hand immediately. Sure. Uh, fear facing is a incredible way to form bonds, um, between people. I mean, they're getting married, so they already have a bond, but it's an right. experience. Yeah, a joint totally. experience. Another weird angle I've had requests for was a bridesmaid who said, um, there are these like wedding challenges where you, um, the, the spouses to be ask their groomsmen or bridesmaids or whatever gender, uh, to be their bridesmaid by taking a photo of them doing something crazy. And then the bridesmaids or groomsmen or whatever the gender neutral word is for that, Mm -hmm. uh, respond with a photo of them doing something crazy, holding up the sign that says, I do. Okay. It's a thing. Okay. I, no judgment. I've never heard of that, but, uh, it's, I guess it's, it, it's cool. Um, so there's like photos of people jumping out of planes. And so I have sure. people call me and they're like, I want to hold up a sign saying I do while I'm breathing fire. <laughs> Can I come and in two hours do that? Oh my God. And I, I, the answer is no. I no. know. For all you fire breathers out there who are torch. watching slash listening to this and just like losing your minds. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, this is a, you know, a New York city thing because there are eight and a half million people right. and I have a lot of press about the space and uh, people want a shortcut. Yeah. And what I uh, used to say to those people was, you don't just like walk into a dojo and ask to go into a tournament because you want a photo op of like karate chopping someone down. Right. You know, like that's insulting to your sensei. Yeah. Really insulting. Um, and then I, you know, didn't make any money on that. So, and then I was like, I have to change my perspective. Is like people want a shortcut to fire. What I do now is it's four hours. The class is $125 a head Mm -hmm. and that makes it worth my time. Um, and I make it worth their time. So they come in and they get a tour of the space. I show them each type of prop and say, this is what it does. Then, um, and actually sometimes I'll do this with my business partner where she does that. And then 
she brings him outside and like surprise fire performance is like a thing that um people like d- depending on what kind of experience people want we'll add that in so they walk outside and i have a fire throne and palm torches <laughs> and I like do some palm torch stuff and then i do some fire eating and some fire fans and it's just like something i would do at a bar mitzvah sure um I mean, not the throne, just because I hate driving at places. But um, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, and then, then we go downstairs to the dance studio, and in front of the mirrored wall, I say, "Okay, this is the Vulcan Tech Gospel." Yeah. And this is the part that like everyone is like kind of eye rolly at, but <laughs> uh, they're like, "What do you mean? There's geometry? Like, I thought I was gonna be breathing fire, you know?" And I'm like, "No." Same time, same direction, everybody. (laughs) Same time, same direction. All right, now we're going to go, you know, and so we go through that. And I I also learned that um, if you give people a set of little moves and you hand them a set of palm torches and light them, they just stare at you and they look sad and scared. Um, Even And you have to say, like, do this thing, do the archer thing, do the sexy girl thing. And they do, but like it's, it doesn't seem satisfying for anybody. So I make a really, really simple choreography with timing and direction and gotcha. the pop torches. Ah, that makes sense. And and I add in things that are not timing and direction. You know. Yeah. Um, I often I, I I always ask my students like, has anyone here? Does anyone rave? Has anyone done liquid? You know, and like if they haven't done that, I won't even teach this. Because, like, that you create more barriers to entry yeah, totally. um, with those challenges. I just do things that they're going to be able to do if they're able-bodied. And even if they're not that, you know, like, I can create something for someone to do. So a little bit of choreography, cheesy pop song, and then they can go out back. They can sit on the throne for photo ops. Mm-hmm. And then uh, they can do their palm torch thing. I stand in front of them with my palm porches and I call out the moves. So they walk away. Oh, and then of course there's a, a brief fire safety lesson. I yeah. just like condense everything down and give them a handout. Mm-hmm. Um, so they get their photo op. They now know that there is timing and direction. They now know that, wow, there's a lot more work that goes into this than I thought. <laughs> and maybe they'll come back and, but and to take a whole series of classes and eight weeks later, I love seeing people come back for that. Yeah. Um, but you have to break off all these a la carte things. Yeah. Um, and this is also keep in mind, like this is me, um, engaging with people who don't go to festivals and stuff. Like you will have an easier time, you know, teaching people who want to go to festivals and get ingrained in the culture and want to nerd out and, juggle every day. Right. Um, but I'm trying to create like a renewable source of income. Um, cause eventually your, your students are, might know everything that you're teaching and drop off and can't afford it. And also people who go to festivals don't have much money. No, they don't. Yeah. And I hate to bring money into it so much, but if I don't, you know, we can't then what do you it do is not sustainable. Yeah, like like we're in a city where everyone's rent is about a thousand dollars, and utilities are astronomical, and um, you know it's like a uh, hundred dollars a month for um, a card. Yeah. And if you want a car, like you have to account for hundreds of dollars of tickets every month. Right. Like, so we have to make it sustainable. And that's just it. I think a, a lot of people out there who think about starting their own businesses in the flow arts. I mean. Everybody, everybody undervalues their time at first. And I think a big part of that is people are kind of afraid to ask for more. They're afraid to think about what their value may be because they're afraid that somebody might tell them no, right? But at the same time, if that's not something that you have coming in, what really is going to be your long-term capability for doing this thing? If your interest is really in providing a service to people, then... If you can't do that in the long term, you're not serving anybody. Yeah. And I see this with prop makers a lot because um, when you start, you really like building things. Yeah. Um, And eventually there are going to be so many other aspects of the business 
that you can't sit there and like put on grip tape. Right. So when you have to hire someone to put on grip tape, then uh, the, pr- the product can't come in at the same price point anymore and you have to raise right. your prices. Mm-hmm. Um, so also you should value your time because you know, you're, you're special and you deserve it. Exactly. And like people need to get paid for their time. So I would say that if you start charging for something you make, give yourself $25 an hour to make it and put that into your price. Unfortunately, we have a lot of brands and they're all setting prices. So that can be hard. Um, And I think that, you know, marketing, you know, yourself as the maker is, is key to that. Like, why is this special? Because like I put my own blood, sweat and tears into this. And like, I'm trying to make a career as a performer. And, um, I also donate my time to, to teach children or or something like that. Like, um, the people in this community are all great people and should be selling themselves like as part of a a product that they're also selling. Um, I see that happen a lot with companies that want to scale up and hire people or they spend all their time working on it problems with their website or customer emails. Yeah. um, Customer service is just like one of those awful black holes of time that quite frankly, like, I mean, I've I've talked with other people who started companies in the flow arts world. It always seems like that is one of those things that, you know, if you're going to hire somebody as you're like growing and everything, that is one of the first things that has to happen because the more volume of anything that you do, Inevitably, there's going to be people that are going to be that are that are going to be writing you about it. Yeah, difficult people. Yes, yes. Um, cool. I want to talk more about this, but and we're already going to go over the hour, <laughs> and uh, that's okay. That's okay with me. If it's okay with you. Sure. Okay. Yeah, cool. I, I want to get into um, fire production. Yes, that's where I want to go next. This. Okay. This is going to be the profiles and flow. This is going to be the equivalent of the uh, the first Velvet Underground album. I, uh, you, you, you know that joke, right? I don't. Uh, so the joke is is that all the twelve people bought the Velvet Underground's first album, but each and every one of them started a band because of it. <laughs> so right, this yeah. is this is going to be the profiles and flow that's going to launch another hundred businesses. I bet you. Um, awesome. So, yeah, let's talk about fire safety and fire safety in New York City, because that has been a huge, huge, huge part of your career for at least the past, what, three or four years now? Yeah, three years. Mm -hmm. Um, So if you want to know what it takes to be a fire spinner in New York City, I'm not going to explain it now (laughs) to thefloasis.com. Yes. And on the menu bar, there's FDNY info. Click on that. And then there are five buttons that people don't realize are buttons. I am not a web designer, um, <laughs> so I apologize. That's okay. uh, but there are five boxes, and you can click on each one of those boxes, and then there is an immense amount of information under those subcategories. Mm-hmm. Um, so it is, it is uh, complicated for a reason. Uh, people get angry when they hear about the bureaucracy and the cost. I... I I would say I hear you on cost, but, um, ultimately, um, there is no, no outdoor performance areas. Um, and creating that was a two year long endeavor where me and Lydia created a, mm-hmm. a free public fire show in the park. And that was just, you have no idea how much permitting mm-hmm. and permission. And so we got rejected six times. Yeah. Well, here, so can, can I pause on this right quick? Cause yeah. there's some context that I want to set here. Cause, um, so when I lived in New York city back in 2007, the idea of being able to do legal, legal fire in New York city was absolutely unthinkable. Like nobody talked about it because it was so beyond the realm of what anybody could imagine that it, it was not something that I remember anybody saying, you know, Hey, we should go talk to this person or Hey, we should go talk to that person. It was just assumed that it would always be a problem. And I knew people who got arrested doing it. Um, so fast forward a few years and, and you've told me this story before you said it started after the Rhode Island fire, right? That's uh, well, uh, that, yeah, that wasn't my, my, uh, 
accomplishment, but Flambeau, um, a Flambeau fire Mm -hmm. after the Rhode Island fire in the nineties, he walked into the FDNY headquarters and said, I'm turning myself in. (laughs) And, you know, I am a professional fire performer and, um, and, um, you know, I've heard it's, it's, it's fascinating because I always heard Flambeau's version. Uh, he's a wonderful storyteller Mm -hmm. and, um, and, I didn't realize how much he got rejected actually until I, hmm. I've been working with the FDNY on a weekly basis and they were like, Oh yeah. The old chief was telling him never, no, never, ever. Um, are we ever going to regulate or allow this? Um, and, uh, the chief that came after him was saying, and this is now two more chiefs have come and gone. Um, was saying um, that that chief would just ignore what was going on. Mm -hmm. Um, Luckily, in New York City, we do have one outdoor spin jam in a park that is uh, part of a park that's very ignored, and it's like a concrete band shell that's kind of crumbling, that we have spin jams. And occasionally people get tickets from the police, never the fire department. And the FDNY has known about this for years. Mm -hmm. And the chief who said I would never allow it, like professionally and indoors, also would ignore that. Um, And that's been a tradition. Um, And to this day, the FDNY will just ignore it. Um, So that's great. And it's because it's all concrete. Um, But the police, like if they want to give you a ticket, they can. I mean you are breaking a uh, law, but, um, the arrest that happened was like ridiculous and, um, that hasn't happened again. Um, so yeah, so as time went on, um, the mayor's office, when it was Bloomberg, um, created this whole like quality of life, uh, campaign and tasked the FDNY with regulating these illegal fire shows. Oh, wow. And I didn't realize it had gotten that far up. Yeah, wow. and um, at Flambeau had been for years chipping away at creating some regulation, and there was an existing uh, procedure for having fire on stage on Broadway. Okay. And so um, eventually the fire department caved and let Flambeau get a permit for Webster Hall. Webster Hall is a club that been was open for 125 years, and... Um, is the size of a Broadway theater. It used to be a ballroom. So they were like, okay, in this instance, we'll give you this permit. And then Flambeau kept asking and he got the permit at the box. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he just kept kind of whittling it down. Um, but at the time it was like only for Broadway. Um, by the time the FDMI was tasked with regulating fire performances, um, Flambeau had now been working around the city, um, all over. So, um, the new chief, Jimmy Lauer asked, uh, Flambeau, can you regulate all of these fire spinners? And, um, it was seen as a problem. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're going into clubs and, and warehouse parties and setting fires in front of curtains and, doing all this crazy stuff. And that was definitely happening. People have had koi heads like land in their lap. We don't have the distances that NFPA requires. We don't have them. NFPA. What is the NFPA? Uh, National Fire Protection Agency is a uh, consulting group, basically. Mm -hmm. Half of the members are fire marshals, basically, are authorities of some sort. Half the members are industry folks. Right. Um, So they put together documents and regulations that they send out across the country that are kind of recommendations that everybody is meant to more or less follow. Right. They are recommendations that fire departments on an individual case by case basis can follow. Mm -hmm. There are, are, um, so we fall under NFPA 160 and in New York city, uh, if we followed NFPA 160, I would not be a full-time fire producer. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the unit that I work with is the explosives unit and they make exceptions. Right. And it, it, just to put a, uh, an asterisk on that right quick, because um, 
so the NFPA regulations may be kind of like a, a nationwide series of recommendations that, um, the, that this organization gives to fire departments all over the country, but they have the option of whether or not they're going to follow them. And there are a lot of places where the fire regulations are a lot less strict, and there are quite a few where they are quite a bit more strict. Right. And uh, it's written like the Bible. Like, it's weird. <laughs> and it's, like, it's like, wait, you have to fit a camel through a needle? Like, no, wait, that's not what they meant, you know. So um, authority having jurisdiction is going to interpret it how they want. And they can also say, you know what, I'm throwing away the rule book because this person, I don't like them yeah. or whatever. Authority having jurisdiction is on every line, and it's up to them. So, um, yeah, so when Flambeau brought me into the explosives unit the first time, uh, Chief Flower said, we got to wrangle, we got to get these people. We got to um, shut them down. We have to, there were a few phrases he used that made the hair and back of my neck stand up. <laughs> And I, um, I was really worried about going in there. I was illegally running the Floasis. I was illegally performing. Um, and um, the attitude, like, wasn't that warm. Um, I brought in a bunch of pamphlets and things from NAFA, from um, AFA, uh, from U UFA, and FAI, all the acronyms. Yeah, right. What are each and, of these acronyms, by the way? Um, Sorry, so, I always treat this thing like it, it, it's an explain like I'm five, you know? Great. Uh, NAFAA is a North American Fire Arts Association started by Ted Ward of Bear Claw. Um, and me and him are the jerks of the uh, fire safety discussion group. And, um, and then there is... Uh, American Fire Artists was just a, a one-woman operation out of um, Minnesota that I still think she has some of the best stuff on paper mm -hmm. about fire safety, and um, she, is no, she used to provide insurance, and she lost her underwriting, so it's no longer a thing. I still use their, their research. Um, UFA is a uh, kind of broke off from NAFA to be another... Um, another acronym. Yeah, and another acronym. And FAI is a uh, Flow Arts Institute, is a amalgamation of fire festivals uh, all over the country that provide flow arts and fire education that um, in the past couple of years has really heavily started incorporating the safety right. for all the same reasons I was saying before. Sure. So just to clarify for people who are out there listening, when we were talking before about NFPA, that is an organization that is composed of fire uh, abatements, professionals, whereas all of the uh, organizations that Tara just listed off here um, are organizations that have been created by fire performers. They're kind of like grassroots organizations or at least people who are outside of uh, the, the fire abatement pool that have kind of tried to come up with rules to help us do this because we don't usually pop up on the radar of the official organizations. Yeah. Um, and if you research NFPA 160 and read it, you'll, it's very obvious that not a single person in that boardroom has ever spun fire before that, <laughs> that chapter. Nor probably has ever even seen it. Yeah. Yeah. Like a good portion of them. Yeah. So, um, so I brought in all this new information for them um, that they had considered, and um, they the explosives unit regulates fire technicians. Mm -hmm. um, now, in your city, you may find that when you try and do a show, they're going to say you need a fire technician to come in and observe. Yep. Um, and my challenge to them was, you have a fire breather, and they bring... Uh, isopropyl alcohol, Coleman camp fuel, and ultra pure lamp oil. Which fuel is not deadly if swallowed? <laughs> or, and even better is you have a fire breather and you have a fire eater, mm -hmm. and which 
one uses which fuel, which one is not deadly if swallowed, and which person puts fuel in their mouth. And they won't know. Right. I mean, even by the terms, when you hear fire eater, you would think that the eater puts fuel in their mouth. Um, but, you know, fire eaters use Coleman Camp fuel, which is the most toxic of those options. Right. And fire breathers use, uh, use lamp oil and, believe it or not, it's not deadly if swallowed. Um, so that challenge right there will stump any fire technician and is proof positive that fire technicians should not be in charge of fire spinners. Yeah. That won my argument. And that's one of my argument in other cities, too. That's awesome. Um, that argument took a lot of work away from fire technicians in New York City. Really? And gave it to me. Yay! Happy ending. And, and I give the work to my friends. Woo! Um, so I encourage any city where you run into that fire technician clause to start that battle. Yeah. I've, I've um, told you my story about the gig that I did in, in Prince George's County around here, right? Was that the sprinkler system issue? Um, no, or? no. It was um, – so PG County, which is right on on, on the edge of D.C., it uh, – so it is one of these places where they decided to come up with more stringent fire protocols than what's in NFPA 160. And one of the ways that they decided to do this was they classified any use of an open flame using a Class 1A fuel as being a pyrotechnician display. So to be able to use white gas, I had to get a licensed shooter to, uh, to, to supervise the performance, which is ridiculous because they have no idea what we do. And they're, they're pretty much just getting paid to sit around and be completely mystified for however long you're performing, right? Yeah, that's a solid fuel. Yeah, yeah. So you know, ba fuel. basically what that means, guys, is white gas is a solid no there. Um, and... After reading this, I came back to them and uh, suggested instead that I use uh, Uplow, uh, Ultra Pure Lamp Oil, because uh, 3C, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's it's outside of the regulations for fuels that they had, and the fire marshal in Prince George's County just went, uh... So they sent somebody out to supervise, because quite frankly, none of them could come up with an answer. And that's how I was able to perform uh, without having to pay hundreds of dollars to have a licensed shooter watch me and be completely mystified by what I was doing. Yeah. <clears throat> Shooters are mitigating risks like static electricity from, like, right. setting off, like, explosives. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're important in, in those jobs, not this job. Mm -hmm. So um, when I challenge the... Explosives experts, the chief and especially the deputy chiefs, and they had no answer. They realized that they were uh, looking at this all wrong. Mm -hmm. And um, Jimmy Lauer, the chief at the time, was um, on his way to retiring. And um, Joe Myers, the deputy, was sort of slated to fill that position. And I was able to, uh, through explaining things like uh, the flow show, which um, we used to have in New York City, and just um, no one has time to run it. Yeah. <laughs> so we don't anymore. I explained to him that we do the flow show, there is no fire, and there isn't even LED. And it's about the, the technical aspects. Right. And um, you ask any person in that show, and they will tell you that flow arts change their life. And he said, I didn't even know that what flow arts was. Um, and... Like, uh, you know, I, I made it really relatable. The interesting thing um, was that he is a biker and right. uh, looks very intimidating and has the same kind of misconceptions that festival goers may have about their appearance, um, where people don't take them seriously and would never put them in charge of something very dangerous. Um, and and uh, he really heard me. I felt really heard. Um, it good. was great. Mm -hmm. And um, I just kept bringing more and more research and started meeting with the editors. And um, he wanted originally fire performers to be considered a pyrotechnic apprentice. Okay. And he gave me the study materials for that license. And I came back and said, 
this is so bad that I think you're trying to test me. <laughs> and, uh, and also, uh, in my ear, I have Flambeau telling me like, don't be disrespectful. And I'm, I mean, I, they enjoy my candor. Uh, I am very lucky with the explosives unit because they are demolition experts. They right. have dug out 20 story holes in bedrock that is almost as hard as diamond in the city with 8 million people like transporting TNT into the heart of the city and climbing into holes where they're breathing in air that will eventually kill them with dynamite in arm and, and blowing up the interior of this Island without disrupting a single thing. They, um, so not, what we do is pretty low on their list of things to be worried about. Yeah, they're not bureaucrats either. They're not great with paperwork. They're, they're, you know, salt of the earth union guys. And now a woman too. Yep. Um, so. Are you they, talking about Grace or yourself? Uh, nobody. They have a female inspector now. Oh, cool. Right on. She's great. Nice. And she was a blaster too. And she's like. Yeah, she's she's been through. She we talk about the struggle. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's it's a really cool department, and in any other city, you're probably not going to have such cool people. Um, you're probably going to have people who are also like firefighters or police. Yeah. Um, and so their attitude is going to be way different. But in New York City, we have the hardest bedrock uh, in the known world, mm-hmm. um, and it just needs like a fuck ton of explosives right um so that's where this department comes from so they like listened and heard me and um and so i brought in this paperwork and i said you have kevlar listed as a fuel what yeah in their original study material because uh like they they see it as like if you were doing propane effects you would have a halo of kevlar in fuel and that's an ignition source for uh uh effect and it just kind of like landed in this category wrong because of the editor sitting at a table and, and hearing that's, uh, an ignition source. So, um, you know, there were like problematic things like that. And the fuels that they listed was, uh, beeswax, lamp oil, tiki, uh, lamp oil again. They, they had like three different names for lamp oil cause they were, they were using brand names alongside scientific names. Oh, good Lord. Um, and I was like, no, you categorize it. These are the lamp oils Mm -hmm. and these are the naphthas and these are the alcohols and, um, backing up for a second. Naphtha is the chemical name for white gas. Mm -hmm. Right. White gas is not even on the label. Right. So, um, they were, I, I mean, you know, in another city, if I was, if I had that much candor, maybe I would have been kicked out of the office, but they listened and like, I took a big risk and even Flambeau was like, don't tell them they're wrong. And I'm like, but <laughs> yeah. they're wrong. And this is, you know, a good thing and a bad thing about me is that I cannot drop something if it's wrong. I, it has to be fixed. Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, we created a separate license. And then uh, Flambeau insisted that there should be a license uh, for higher up fire performers with more experience. And um, it took us months of going back to the board table every week and saying, but what is it? And we came up with the fire producer. And what that comes down to in regulation is just the thing that that, that if a non-licensed fire performer wants to get on stage and perform, they need to be supervised Mm -hmm. by a producer. Yeah. Um, but what it has turned into for me is an entire business of, uh, equipment rental compliance, uh, pre-site inspections, um, creating site diagrams, pulling paperwork, um, negotiating between, uh, performers and venues and fire departments to make everyone happy. And it's been a really, really cool job. I feel like I am inventing it as I go and much like my clothing line where it didn't exist before and no one thought they needed it is turning into an ubiquitous thing. If a fire performer finds a theater and the theater says, we want to run your show three days a week for two months. How? 
<laughs> the second form is just like call Tara because I don't know. Yeah. And she's the woman to do it. And um and um it's it's really cool. Uh, I lo- I'm very nerdy about ventilation and soft goods and and all that jazz and compliance and um I like a good challenge. Um and I'd like to take shows on the road and figure out compliance everywhere. Yeah. And, uh, like secretly, maybe a little of what I like about it is like when you meet a fire marshal who's just so dead wrong and <laughs> you can stump them mm-hmm. and see that look on their face and then they treat you differently. Yeah. Um, I think as a woman in most male dominated fields, like you've got to do that thing where um, you use a big word or pull out a fact or get them in a trick question or something before you get respected yeah. and that you can watch it change in front of you. Yeah. Um, and, and the relationships will turn over. Um, so that's really satisfying for me. It's been a big part of why I keep doing it. Yeah. Well, and after working with you to create this process by which you can get licensed as a fire performer or producer, they've been encouraging you to add additional licenses to, uh, to, to your portfolio, right? Yep, I have ten licenses now. Wow! Um, so, what 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 all do you get to do now because of those licenses? So, um, one valuable license was uh, right. I already have a flame retardant clothing line. So one of the first ones that I got was the C15, which is uh, for flame proofing non flame retardant fabrics mm-hmm. and certifying fabrics um, to be either flame proof or inherently um, flame resistant. So, in the winter time, if work is slow. I will pick up work going to venues and spraying their curtains and, and certifying them. Yeah. Um, but also if I am a fire producer on a job and I walk in and I see a curtain on the stage, is that certified? No. Well, if I didn't have the skill set, I would be like, well, we can't do the show or like, let's call this service. And that's when balls start dropping. So sure. I can pick up that ball and keep running with it. Um, uh, another license I have is the S95 license to disarm, um, alarms. And so I can call to the headquarters of the alarm company and have them turn off the sensors for the duration of our show. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, um, people think that's like crazy that you need a licensed person to do that. But if a, if a bar restaurant could turn off smoke detectors willy nilly, uh, we run into situations like there'd be no point in having the smoke detectors in the first place. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that license is helpful for fire shows, obviously. Yeah. Um, and then I have fire guard licenses. Mm-hmm. So a fire guard could be a security guard or an usher, but you need a license that says you understand the um, what a clear walkway should be. Yeah. And so security guards often just stand there and say, don't block the hall, don't block the hall, don't block the hall. It's an important job when there's an emergency. Sure. Um, also, if an exit is difficult if there's a curtain over an exit sign Mm -hmm. they can stand there and in the event of emergency their contingency plan is to pull back the curtain and open the door and scream exit if someone well someone did do that at the ghost ship fire in oakland and they saved a lot of lives but if they had some emergency lighting and a real security guard a lot more people would be alive because people couldn't find their way out so uh these all seem like oh god there's so much bureaucracy but um as the chief says, uh, fire code is written in blood. Yeah. Uh, this is all because of some people dying tragically that didn't have to. Right. Um, so those are the fire guard licenses. Uh, what else do I do? Um, and you're like, if I'm not mistaken for some of these licenses, you're the first woman to acquire them, right? Uh, well, I was the first person to acquire the fire producer license. So I was the first woman. <laughs> okay. Uh, next was Flambeau and next was Claire. So, yeah. um, and then I think we're like 50, 50 male, female right now. Okay. Um, pyrotechnics wise, I may have been for the pyrotechnic apprentice license. Mm-hmm. Maybe. I don't know for sure. Um, because that license was very new. Yeah. That, was rolling out when my licenses were rolling out and I wanted to pursue pyrotechnics and I actually convinced the fire department not to incorporate me and my life, my ilk into that. Yeah. And then I had to struggle to get that (laughs) (laughs) 
Um, but the more you know, though, right? Yeah, right. So I have the pyrotechnic apprentice license, so I can do all kinds of special effects under someone else. I also have the E20 um, pyrotechnic fireworks shooter license. Yeah. Um, and I'm not the first woman to, to get that. I work for Gucci and I went to a class where there were 40 men and me. I was the only one to graduate in that class that was female. Mm-hmm. Um, and But I've met other E20 uh, female pyrotechnicians. I've never met a woman that does other kinds of pyrotechnics and special effects in New York City. But like an E18 or an E19, um, they might exist. Um, I think that's, oh, and then I have some G licenses. I have, uh, gas licenses. I have the G23 to operate propane effects outdoors. Mm -hmm. And the G46 is for non-flammable gases, uh, storage, handling, and use. So, uh, like cryogenics, like CO2 and haze, things like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, storing any kind of tank of any kind of compressed gas is pretty much covered Mm -hmm. under those two. So to, to kind of summarize this experience then, um, as Flambeau had come in trying to develop a process by which people could legally uh, perform with fire in New York City, at some point you were brought into the process and made several breakthroughs by showing the fire department how that there were quite a few things about many of the things that they created rules for that they didn't know and that we as fire performers did and that that allowed for a very, very crucial uh, kind of breakthrough with them in realizing that you shared expertise with them and helped create a system by which people can become officially licensed to either perform with fire in New York City or teach other people how to do it and inspect venues uh, for that. And along the way, you they they've been impressed enough by your depth of knowledge that they've been encouraging you to get additional licenses for uh the use of pyrotechnics in new york city and this has become a whole other source of income and career for you in the past few years yeah um changing propane tanks is my friday and saturday night (laughs) um and the funny thing about my Saturday night changing propane tanks and also monitoring said propane effect is that I work there um, at the Botanical Gardens mm-hmm. in the Bronx. Thanks to Liz Knights, got me that job. Woo! Yeah. And then I jump in my van and I drive down to Manhattan and I supervise a weekly show that's been running for six months. And every single Saturday there is a guy and a girl, female, a, a fire performer that uh, – do the sexy fire act. We have a lead couple and a secondary couple. So that's four fire performers, um, that are pretty much paying rent on that Saturday night job. Nice. Um, and, uh, two fire safeties. And I also alternate with about a s- five or six people on that job. We get paid rehearsals. We, we like, uh, we get fed at the show. We get treated great. Um, and it's, it's been a great experience because I, uh, I'm happier backstage than mm-hmm. on stage. Yeah. And I'm now in this position where like I can come into the venue and guarantee that they won't fail inspection, get it to pass inspection, help with all the casting needs and, and get my friends work. And, um, that's been the most satisfying thing about it. Um, and, uh, Another really incredible thing, you know, trying to get into pyrotechnics has been really challenging. I've been looking for a letter of recommendation for three years mm-hmm. um, to get above, beyond a apprentice. Yeah. Ship, and I uh, haven't gotten it at all. Gotten a lot of rejection. Um, and there's a new device on the market that was came out to be a non-pyrotechnic device mm-hmm. that doesn't have black powder. It doesn't have an e-match. It takes titanium, heats it up, and shoots up a, a fifteen up to a fifteen foot column of sparks Whoa. without using an ignition source or any explosives. And um, I really wanted to operate these, and my club uh, is is trying to buy them right now. Yeah, the FBNY and NFPA are trying to categorize it right now, but um, yeah. 
For those of you guys who are who are listening to this on SoundCloud, I'm just like staring at Tara with like my jaw dropping, like what in God's name? And there's videos of the technicians turn they turn it on and they put their hand right into the stream of the sparks. They can oh. put a sheet, sheet of paper into the stream of the sparks and hold up the piece of paper and it is not burnt. The sparks come out at at the low on the low end of temperature range of 40 degrees. The glowing. They can get hotter. They've clocked in at around 100. Um, Again, jaw on the floor. I'm how technology. Technology. Um, yeah, it, yeah. I don't want to get too much into the. the yeah, I, yeah, yeah. That that's kind of outside the bounds of what we're talking about. That's super freaking cool, though. My God. But yeah, and so a thing that I did was so I um, I convinced a venue um, to rent these machines for one of their anniversaries and have me operate it. And then, um, you know, the fire department kicked back with like, no, your apprentice license doesn't entitle you to be able to operate this machine. Um, because in New York city, we're very strict. We're going to treat this thing like an explosive device. So you need a higher class license to do this. So the past four months I have talked with the vice president of the company, like every couple of weeks and, uh, the, the inspectors and the chief at the explosives unit about what would it take? Because um, one of the things it takes to get any kind of license is a certificate of completion from the training program. Mm -hmm. So I've been calling this company saying we need, you need to make a a training program. And I beta tested their online course where you had to get a hundred percent on each category. Sure. And that was difficult. (laughs) It was very difficult. I can imagine. Um, I was like, oh, I'll bang this test out in a week. And like three weeks later, I was still cursing at it. And I'm also working on my OSHA, which only requires like 70%. So, um, you know, I just, I'm so comfortable at this point talking to the men who are in charge uh, about letting me in that I just don't stop. And it's that tenacity that um, it's gotten to the point where um, I should very soon be able to operate these machines at the club where we have the fire eating duet Awesome! and, uh, it's still a work in progress. So I'm going to knock on wood. Um, mm-hmm. and also the company has asked me to be their representative in New York city and, hey. and approve pyrotechnicians to use these devices. People with, you know, the higher credential pyro license have to go through me. Um, and that's, sure to open up more apprenticeships and that letter of recommendation that I've been looking for for years. Um, and I just kept bugging them and saying, give me the test. What do I need? And, you know, I just finished reading a 300 page manual and, uh, like light afternoon reading. Yeah. (laughs) Um, and that's what I've been, what I did with fire arts and now I'm doing it with pyrotechnics and, and that's, you know, I have 10 licenses, so people will listen to me and take me seriously. Um, you know, I'm not trying to grasp it at the, you know, class A license yet, but um, that's been my technique and it's it's working. And I think also um, you have to be likable and presentable and um, things like that. Like I haven't been, I haven't cursed anyone out. Um, <laughs> Yes. They may want to. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so that's an, another small victory that, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to really get into that field. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that stage pyro and fire performance belong on stage together. We see it in Europe with Pyroterra and right, the fuel totally. vehicles. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you were to try and produce a show like that in the United States, county by county is going to be completely different. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, my big focus has been this like division of labor between what is a fire performer, what is a pyrotechnician. And what I really want to do is both have them on stage together and like, you know, and tour around. So, so this segues perfectly into where I wanted to, uh, draw this part of uh, the interview to a close, which is, you know, you've become involved now in trying to, uh, rewrite the regulations nationwide. I've, I've been, you know, I've, I've seen conversations back and forth, um, 
between you and Ashley Bertling and uh, some of the folks who are trying to get an FPA 160 rewritten so it covers performers like us. And I know you've been involved in trying to, uh, for lack of a better term, kind of uh, liberalize the fire regulations in New Hampshire, which is right next door. So you're, you're, you've, you've done this work of uh, kind of creating a, uh, a, a legitimate path for fire performers in New York. And, you know, it looks like the future is trying to make some of those inroads happen now nationwide. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and I want to really clarify, um, because I, I hear this from people all over the country, that they mistake these efforts for trying to make the very difficult NYC, FDNY regulations national. Mm-hmm. And I don't. And, you know, I did an interview with MK of, uh, I don't remember if it was for FAI or for Fire, I think it was for Fire Arts Magazine, mm-hmm. about this. And I, and I really, I'm going to say it again. I don't think that there should be one national standard and I don't think that the standard should be the New York standard. Yeah. Um, Because everywhere else there are public parks where people spend fire and the police and the fire department drive by and wave at them and keep going. And I want that to continue. But uh, there was a, a whole slew of issues in Seattle where they tried to regulate uh, and ban the use of Class 1A fuels, which you mentioned before, is white gas, yep. um, that the community then had to step in and do triage. Yeah. Um, and uh, their fire marshal in New Hampshire has issued written warnings to fire performers stating that if they were caught performing with fire again, they'd be arrested. Right. Um, so... Um, those, those tactics are like not going to help the fire performing community or the fire departments, and it's not going to create the synergy that I've created in New York City. Unfortunately, the synergy in New York City requires a lot of um, hoops to jump through, and it you wouldn't need that many hoops to jump through in other areas. Sure. Um, like Alaska, if you call the fire marshal and say, we're going to have a spit jam, they're like, why are you calling me? <laughs> Leave me alone. Yeah. <laughs> you know what you're doing. Um, but um, And like understanding the needs of your area and representing your community is, uh, is going to be key because there are states where there are burn bans because of rampant wildfires. Right. So um, like there are legitimate reasons for that. And, um, and the hardest part of being that person that's the community leader is dealing with the renegades. Um, and they're everywhere in in New York city. They want to, um, go into a nightclub and stand on a go-go platform with like the fuel at their feet and eat fire. And and I don't agree with that. And, you know, those people have taken issue with me. It's fine. I've gotten personally attacked or called names, whatever. Um, and then, you know, like dry states, I've seen a uh, video of somebody spinning poi in front of a sign that says, um, you can stop wildfires, there's a burn ban and right. like a, a fine for fires. And they're, you know, laughing in the face of the fire department. That's never going to get you what you want from your fire department. Um, so, uh, and another thing I also want to point out, uh, which is sad, is that in cities where people make money fire performing, <clears throat> their troops are mean to each other. Yeah. And um, they use safety as a way to discredit their competitors. Yes. Um, and it may or may not be valid. And um, it's, it's ha- and one of the things about New Hampshire is that a fire performer was really uh, trying to impress the fire marshal by shit talking other people and uh, a festival that happens up there and, and made all these claims and it turns out that person had never even been to that festival. Yeah. Um, so um, whether the claims are legitimate or not, it is way more important to regulate within your community and decide on a standard that meets your environment. Um, and when I started, um, some people said that I, I was at odds with uh, Coney Island Sideshow. Mm-hmm. And so I invited the person 
who made those claims to my house and like served him punch and pie and like we had a good time and afterwards he says oh wow like everything I heard about you is wrong um and when I reached out to the general managers of Coney Island they were like no we don't we don't have anything against you and um now every once in a while the general manager of Coney Island will call me and we kind of talk about life as a producer um so you know and I had to bridge some gaps because they do teach fire breathing with Kingsford and I don't agree with it Mm -hmm. um but we came to an agreement not to ban it yeah we just agree not to ban fire breathing with white gas and gasoline and diesel. So, um, you may have to, they make were some fire problems. breathing with gasoline. Uh, we banned that. Okay. That we, we decided across the board, we can all say is not okay. 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 Good. I'm like, whoa there. That was the thing we agreed on banning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Um, so, you know, I had to make some compromises and, um, uh, and, and really reach across some aisles. Um, but going to your fire marshal and ratting someone out is counterproductive to our entire community's movement. Even if that person is the worst, yeah. it's best to get everyone else in the community to, to do some tough love and say like, even if I don't like you as a person, like I'm addressing your practices as the issue and let me, um, show you like use a double bucket have a safety just don't be a fuckwad yeah. come on yeah um and i think there's a way to appeal and the the, the sentence that really kind of struck um the explosives unit the first time i went in their office was like if there's an accident at all it's it's on my entire community my entire industry i i'm gonna suffer and so i want everyone else to be safe and they were like, you know, we say that all the time is that like, it's going to take one accident, you know? And I don't, and the fire department didn't think that we had that perspective. Yeah. Um, so that's like a really important thing to say, like, you know, I agree. Like if we have something like a ghost ship fire or a station nightclub fire and it's caused by one of us, like it's going to be devastating. It's game over. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, just the, the weight of that responsibility um, keeps us up at night and we want to fight it as well. And we're not going to fight it by pushing people into the shadows and operating illegally. Right. We can fight it by coming together, identifying the risks, mitigating the risks together and trusting each other, gaining each other's trust. So um, like in community and with the authorities, that should always be why we're here. Yeah. That is beautifully stated. Thank you, Tara. And I don't want it to cost as much as it does. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's always compromises, you know, there's always yeah, compromises. Like I can't change the price of the parking tickets or the permits. I yeah. Can't. I'm only one woman. Um, but yeah, I, uh, if you're having a problem with a marshal, this is how you approach them. If you have a good relationship with your marshal, don't try and fix it. I mean, in Chicago, what Ashley Bertling is up against is there's just absolutely no indoor fire performing allowed. Mm -hmm. um, and so I hope that the New York City model can help her um, win that in her area. And in New Hampshire, it's a very cost prohibitive license. Um, but the license is actually more liberal in that, like, only one person in an entire troop needs to have it. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. So that's one thing I do want to point out that um, is not so bad about New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. I went to Neff and I supervised the entire fire circle. Right. That was a couple hundred people for hours and hours and hours. And I just stood there and didn't take a pee break the whole time. Right. Um, so, you know. Um, you can jump through these hoops and don't be discouraged by them. Um, it is much more difficult to become a pyrotechnician and, um, I'm not letting that stop me. And, uh, you know, I think creating that division of labor is a good approach if you're having difficulty with the FDMY or with your fire department. Yeah. Cool. I, I think that that is a, uh, a, a great sentiment to take us home on here because, uh, you know, the responsibility is on all you guys out there watching or listening to take what you've learned here today and start to build these changes in your own communities. Yep. 
Cool. Nice to Exactly. Well, <laughs> Tara, I want to thank you so much for uh, joining me today and for imparting so very much knowledge uh, in, in the course of this uh, last hour and a lot. Um, and uh, I want to thank uh, my patrons on Patreon for making uh, this here feature possible. If you want to, you can help sign up to make these videos possible at patreon.com slash drexfactorpoi. Uh, and I want to thank especially the friends of the channel, uh, which is Dark Monk, Amazing Lights, Flow Toys, Spin Balls, and Ultra Poi for uh, helping make the videos on this channel possible. Tara, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for all the work that you've done for this community and for joining me today. Yeah, thank you, Drex. My pleasure. All right. All right, there we go. So, sorry, friends, we thought we were done, and then I realized I made a huge error in that I didn't tell you guys where you could find out more information about Tara and the very, very many efforts she's a part of. So, to start off with, to find Tara online, your best bets are to go to the Floasis, which is floasis.com, right? Thefloasis.com. Thefloasis.com. And that includes a lot of fire safety information as well as where you can learn about classes that are being taught at the Floasis. Um, you can also find Third Earth Fireproof on Facebook and Instagram. You got an Instagram uh, profile, right? Nah, it's just pictures of cats and food. Um, <laughs> uh, Etsy. Etsy. Uh, mm -hmm. Third Earth Fireproof on Etsy. And if you type in thirdearthfireproof.com, with the number or the letters, it's going to just redirect to my Etsy. Okay, so, cool. Yeah. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't really have a website on performing and producing. It's uh, people find me through the Floasis mostly. So. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. So that is how you find Tara and all the amazing projects that she is a part of online. Thank you again, Tara. Yeah. <laughs>